Hello everyone, my fellow time travellers, friends and family you are now. It's great to have you with me as we travel through space and time, always together, because who would want to make this odyssey alone? Uh, but before we set off on yet another stage of the journey, uh, I need to say thanks, big thanks to all the people who support this podcast uh, by signing up to my patreon.com site. Paul and I work away on this content, uh, but it's the it's the money that comes in from Patreon that makes it possible to do that and everything else. It's a small fee to join, uh, but it's, it's all of that collectively that makes everything else happen. So if you're part of that uh, contribution, huge thanks. If you're not a member yet and you feel it's time you became part of the family, uh, you know, just just go to patreon.com, look for me by name and, and, and follow the path. There's lots on the site. There's an enormous amount of content on it by now. And there's, at, at all times, there's the, there, there's the opportunity to feedback, in, to reply and comment. You know, you can get involved with everything that happens on here. So there's, there's new stuff every week. Uh, there's a, a, a Q&A session. Nothing's off limits. I don't mind, whatever. A lot of it's history, archaeology, uh, politics. There's no question you shouldn't be allowed to ask. Uh, there's nothing that you shouldn't be allowed to uh, say that you want clarification about or just to say right out there that you doubt the veracity of something you've been told. It, that's the way it ought to be. Okay, that's the advert over. It's time to get back to the podcast. In preparation for which, please strap yourselves into the time machine as we set off towards the next stop in my love letter to the world. Recorder, microphone, action. had not existed before. He creates something that's entirely new. Great power, wealth and influence, the cradle of civilization for thousands of years. At its heart now, Nebuchadnezzar and the mighty city of Babylon with its mesmerizing hanging gardens as power in the ancient world turned on its axis. This old order waned and a new kid on the block took over, freeing slaves, championing religious tolerance and becoming famed for a benevolent rule whose influence reverberates down through history. Endeavouring to understand history in hopes of illuminating the future, I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the world. Hi Neil. In the last episode, we travelled to China to follow the way and the thinking of Confucius. Where are we this week? Morning, Paul. This week we're leaving China behind uh, and the great thinking that held its ancient empire together. And we're travelling back to Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization. The moment in time we've come to witness is the flowering of the Persian Empire and the rise to power of Cyrus the Great. The gravitational pull of Mesopotamia still holds us at this point in the story of the world. Uh, Mesopotamia, which is the, the land between the rivers, the rivers being the Tigris and the Euphrates, uh, it's that centre of the old world, the, the wellspring of civilization that, that we've not broken free from yet. Uh, it was home to the very first moment the story of Enheduanna, the first named poet. She comes from, lived and died in the territory of Mesopotamia. Um, and so we're, we're there again, but it, it's worth pointing out that we're there for the last time in, in any meaningful sense. Uh, what happens today will draw a line under Mesopotamia and Babylon. Uh, We've mentioned more than once the King Hammurabi, uh, who goes down in history as the law giver, not the law maker. He had he commissioned a, a large uh, black stone, a stele, 
a, a, a column of, of dark black stone uh, to be inscribed with the law, the law of the land. And it's gone down as the law of Hammurabi, but he would acknowledge that it, it, he didn't compose the laws. There was an abiding sense at that time in, in the world that the, the law came down from above. It, it came down from the world of the gods or God. It wasn't in the gift of men, humans, to create law. The law was there. The law was just there. And it was it was it was put into the hands of men. Uh, and so Hammurabi had this stele of featuring the law of the land, put in a, in a prominent place at the heart of his kingdom so that there was no defence in ignorance. You couldn't say, oh, I didn't know that was the law because anyone, anyone could come and consult the law of Hammurabi. By, let's say, the 18th century, before the time of Jesus Christ, Hammurabi was in control of, a, of an empire or a territory that measured about 700 miles long by 100 miles wide. Obviously, when you think about the, the Roman Empire or, or the British Empire, it sounds almost like a dot on the map, but by the standards of the time, that was pretty good going. As well as Babylon, there was the city of Mari, on the Euphrates and the cities of Nimrud and Nineveh on the Tigris. But as is the case, as is the plight of kings, although they extend the, the shadow of their hand over their empire or their kingdom while they're alive, there's only so much they can do to shape the future. And it's very much then down to the ability of their successors. And the fact is, although Hammurabi was a, was a powerful figure, those that came after him were not necessarily strong enough to maintain what he had created. Suffice it to say, a couple of centuries after, after Hammurabi, two centuries after he was dead and gone, a people called the Hittites had conquered the empire of, of Hammurabi and his descendants. However, the name of Babylon survived. Uh, and obviously, Babylon survives to the present day. It was etched so deeply into the story of the world back then that it was never erased in that sense. Uh, and it's come down to us as, as a, in many ways, a, a, a benchmark for decadence, uh, even for sin and corruption. Babylon has within it the idea of something that had gone too far, that had, you know, that had maybe something slightly rotten at the heart of it. And that's always worth bearing in mind at a time like this, you know, Many people say that the West, our West, the world of the West, is victim now to its own decadence. Uh, that we have lost some kind of, I don't know, we've lost religion. We have slipped our moorings in some way. And that decadence might be or will be our undoing, which, which makes the story of Babylon uh, a warning. It's a, you know, it's something to... To, to which we ought to pay attention. Babylon will never be forgotten. It, it was in Babylon that the, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which we've mentioned before, Epic of Gilgamesh is that story that's older than the Old Testament, but yet has within it the story of a flood uh, being sent by the gods to destroy the world and only a single family being given instructions on how to survive it. Uh, there's much more than that in the Epic of Gilgamesh, but it, so it has with it the, the flood story, the, the, a version of which is then there in the Old Testament with Noah, obviously, and, and his family. The Epic of Gilgamesh was, it would appear, was perhaps first committed to clay tablets in Babylon. That might have been the, the first place where uh, something that had been oral, something that had been a story that was recited and, and performed and remembered, w was first fixed in the form of clay tablets. That that happened in Babylon in all likelihood. And there's there's something more profound, I think, about the memory of a figure like Hammurabi. If you think of him as the law giver, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, whether you are religious or a person of faith or not, whether you're an atheist, doesn't matter. At the mention of the word God, when I say God, for most people, 
whether they believe or not, will get a mental image of a big grandfatherly figure, you know, maybe with long hair and a beard, all grey, maybe sitting up somewhere up high, out of sight, you know, at the top of a ziggurat, if you like, up, up there, and handing, handing law down from above with his hand over everything, either in blessing or in judgment. That, that's the mental image that most people it, who are products of the Judeo-Christian tradition have when they think about God. Well, it's the very existence of someone like Hammurabi. His reality haunts our present in the form of, of an image that for many people is the very idea of what God is. And, and it, out of Babylon, out of Mesopotamia, had come that notion of a world created from the chaos of the floods, you know, of a, you know, a, somewhere where it was all just, you know, chaos and storm and flood and dust that out of that had been created order. That's, that comes to us out of Mesopotamia. Uh, also the idea of human beings being made from the clay of the world, actually made in molds like cakes, <laughs> you know, like, like gingerbread men, you know, actually shaped by the gods. And, and produced in that way. And, and overall, at the top of a ziggurat, a, a, a figure, a, a powerful presence. So that, that all sustains and prevails down into our world. So although Babylon is behind us and gone into history, that idea of order out of chaos, heaven and hell, good and evil, it all comes out of that world. Um, so we've mentioned that the Hittites came a couple of hundred years after, so but maybe by the 16th century before the time of Jesus Christ, the Hittites were, were in control of Mesopotamia and Babylon. They were gone as well by about 1200 BC. There's always an uncertainty, a, a degree of confusion, because so many people were, were drawn into that centre of gravity. Lots of different people were coming and going, literally and metaphorically kicking up a dust cloud. All those pounding hooves, all those, all those marching feet in their sandals. There's a dust there that, that obscures the view and we have to try and peer through it to try and understand what's going on. But into that, into that Mesopotamia were coming Indo-Europeans, uh, people coming in out of the north, you know, descending uh, marching down, coming in in ever greater numbers around the same time that the Hittites were going over the hill into history. At around the same time, the Hebrews are on the move. Hebrew is a word that means, literally means wanderer. You know, people of no fixed abode. We know both from the Bible and, and also from other sources that these Hebrews, they had originally come out of the land of Canaan, maybe 1800 years before the time of Jesus Christ, you've got the figure of Abraham, who as well as being one of the patriarchs out of the Bible, he came out of Canaan and he didn't come alone. The Hebrews were on the move. It, it looks as though at, at some point there was a time of famine in, in Canaan and people upped and moved towards Egypt. They sought help or they saw they were immigrants, you know, they were economic migrants, they were refugees out of somewhere troubled. Uh, they seem to have been the descendants of Jacob, another figure out of the Bible, whose son was Joseph. Well, he's one of his many sons, Joseph of the multicolored coat. Uh, Joseph led the way, uh, led, led the people into Egypt, got them established in Egypt, did well under the time of the pharaohs. They're there for some largely unknowable period of time. They then have their exodus. So around this time, when the Hittites are no longer in control of Mesopotamia, when the Indo-Europeans are on the move into that part of the world out of the north, it's at that point that the Hebrews are wandering out of Egypt, uh, led by Moses. Uh, by this time, they worship one god, who they seem to have called Yahweh, Jahweh. That same God is the one that's worshipped by the kings of Israel, David and then Solomon, 
so that the wandering Hebrews establish themselves in the promised land, which is Israel, which is the northern of two kingdoms. There's Israel in the north, and then there's another little kingdom to the south called Judah. You've got David and Solomon in that part of the world recognised as kings. It's Solomon that brings in the Phoenicians to build the first temple. You know, we've covered, we've, we've had that story before. At that time, back in Mesopotamia, there are more new people coming in. There are Arameans, there are Kassites. Then, in their own time, there are Assyrians. Uh, the Assyrians, even by the standards of the day, seem to have been especially cruel, bloodthirsty conquerors. Uh, so they come into Mesopotamia and they take control of it. In the 8th century BC, the Assyrians invaded Israel. They invaded that land of the Hebrews. In so doing, or at the same time, they remade Nineveh, which is in modern-day Iraq. They, they recast Nineveh in their own image. By the 7th century BC, there's a king called Ashurbanipal who established a library. Ashurbanipal, as well as being a successful ruler, he was also um, an intellectual and collected clay tablets, the acquired wisdom of the day, which he assembled in a library. Ashurbanipal also had a copy of the Epic of Gilgamesh there. So you've got all this, you've got all this mixing of people. You've got the you've got Hebrews in Israel, you've got the Kingdom of Judah, but then in the, in that wider part of the world, in in, the, in in Mesopotamia, you've got the Assyrian Empire in control. There are Scythians uh, coming out of Central Asia, also coming into the mix. Uh, there are Medes and other people coming out of territory that we would know as. Iran, and at some critical point, the Scythians and the Medes come together as one and defeat the Assyrians. So if you're confused by all that's going on, it's almost inevitable. It's this constant ebb and flow, waxing and waning, one people, one group after another in the ascendant, and then their time passes and they are in their own turn are subsumed by others coming through. We're coming to the moment, though, the latest moment in the in the story of the world in in a hundred moments. There's a last hurrah for Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he is a another figure like Hammurabi. In his own time, in his own moment, he's powerful. He's well organized. He knows what he's doing. His army sacks Jerusalem in 587 BC, there or thereabouts. He tears down or he orders the tearing down of the temple. The temple that had been built under the orders of Solomon by the Phoenicians is destroyed during that invasion by Nebuchadnezzar. And it's Nebuchadnezzar that rounds up the people of Jerusalem and carries them off into their exile in Babylon that is so central to the, you know, to the, to the Bible story. During their exile, uh, those Hebrews in Babylon, create the Hanging Gardens. Okay, so the, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which are one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, uh, are the work of those captive Hebrews. Probably worth stating, the seven wonders of the ancient world are recognised as the Great Pyramid of Giza, uh, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Statue of Zeus at Olympia, uh, the Temple of Diana at Ephesus, the Tomb of Mausolus at Helicarnassus, it's from Mausolus that we actually get the word mausoleum, the Colossus of Rhodes and the Pharos Lighthouse of Alexandria. Of, of those, the only one that still exists in the modern world is the, is the Great Pyramid at Giza. I've actually visited the site of the Temple of Diana at Ephesus, but there's nothing there. It's reduced to it's gone. It's, it's a site, it's a location, but there's nothing. There's nothing there. So Nebuchadnezzar is in Mesopotamia and, and he's making a big empire at that time then. Mm. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar is, it's a last, it's a last flowering. It's a, it's a last glory time for Babylon, for the city of Babylon, uh, for Babylonia, if you like. There's that final last flowering under that last capable ruler, Nebuchadnezzar. So he that invades Jerusalem, it's he that carries off the, 
the Hebrews or some of the Hebrews into the exile that's never forgotten that, that time by the rivers of Babylon where we sat down all of that uh, you know that was that was never forgotten that was happening that was happening that was being driven by another of those single figures in the form of Nebuchadnezzar who had his act together and was able to shape the world around him in his own image in his own time but once again after Nebuchadnezzar after that last flowering it goes away uh, his successors are not as able they're not as capable as him and it's in this time when the last ruler of Babylon of Mesopotamia is King Nabonidus but rising elsewhere is a figure called Cyrus the Great who's the first king of the so-called Achaemenid Empire. He is born into a little-known kingdom called Elam. But he is another of these figures of great ability. Uh, and during the, the middle of the 6th century, before the birth of Jesus Christ, he assembles an army, he moves against a neighbouring kingdom uh, of the Lydians, also against the Medes, who we've previously heard of, and he swallows them up. He, he takes control of them. He, he brings them within his emergent empire. In 539 BC, and this is the moment, he turns on Nabonidus, the last king of Babylon. Nabonidus had tried to turn his people on to worshipping the moon. Uh, he tried to reshape religion. Uh, in a way that he preferred. Now that's a, that's a recurrent theme under one king after another from ancient times through to relatively modern times. You know, king, kings that get uh, that meddle with the way the people are worshipping. You know, look at King Charles the uh, first meddles with the way people are are worshipping in his own country and brings a civil war down upon himself that ends up with him being parted from his head. But you know, kings kings make this mistake from time to time. Nabonidus is one of them. So he had. Much to the annoyance of the people, he'd had them worship the moon. They preferred to worship the old god Marduk. Marduk had been worshipped for centuries by that point. He was worshipped as the as the god of gods, the, the, the king amongst the gods. There had been a time when the world was threatened with destruction by a monstrous figure. Uh, Marduk promised the other gods that he would go and deal with it if they would bow down and worship him. He dealt with the problem and and positioned himself at the top of the pantheon of gods. This was the god that the people of Babylon preferred to worship. Cyrus was a politician as well as a, a military leader. He knew that this had been happening in Mesopotamia, in Babylon, under Nabonidus, and he sent messengers ahead and said if they would accept him, if they would take him, uh, Cyrus, as their king, he would chase out Nabonidus and they could worship whoever they wanted. And it worked. The people of Babylon opened their arms to him. Nabonidus, being a fundamentally a weak figure, fled, and Cyrus is now Cyrus is now in control of what had been Mesopotamia. He simply swallows Mesopotamia up within his empire. Now, amongst other things, we know so much about this because he, at some point during his reign, he commissioned the, the creation of a, an artifact. It's a, it's like a, it looks a bit like a clay rugby ball. It's about that size and it's about that shape. It's usually described as a cylinder, but it, it's more of a kind of a rugby ball shape. It's incised with Akkadian cuneiform, which is another of these early alphabets. And it tells a story, this cylinder has with on it a story that mattered to Cyrus. It tells how he drove off Nabonidus. It tells how he established freedom of religion, that he was a benign ruler. Uh, and all of those, critically, who had been enslaved by Nebuchadnezzar and his heirs were set free and sent home. And that included the Hebrews. The Hebrews were amongst those who had been enslaved by Nebuchadnezzar and were still there. Well, it was down to Cyrus that they were sent home. And it's it's recorded. It's uh, It was never forgotten, that act of what was regarded as generosity. So the Hebrews were sent home and they were able to rebuild their temple. They built the second temple, the one that had been destroyed during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, 
The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. And that's as it's recounted in the book of Ezra. So that moment that's recorded there on this on this cylinder is, was never forgotten. That was the freeing of the Hebrews, which enabled the return to Jerusalem and the construction of the second temple. The cylinder, the artifact, was found in 1879 uh, by an archaeologist called Hormuzd Rassam, uh, who also found Ashurbanipal's library and the Epic of Gilgamesh. So he had he had quite the successful career. Where is that in today's world? You'd say it's in Iraq. Uh, ba- Babylon, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, uh, all of this. It's in, it's in, it's all, these are all sites within the territory that we would know as Iraq. Which is so ironic. You know, for, for most people of our age and younger, you know, Iraq is a, is a place synonymous with, you know, Saddam Hussein and, and war and, and and the invasion foist upon them by the United States and our own forces under Tony Blair and all the rest of it. You know, so Iraq is, is just uh, synonymous as a place of strife. And yet, and yet, actually, it's the location of Babylon, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, uh, you know, and all of that, all of these places, Ashurbanipal's library, the Epic of Gilgamesh, these, these foundational artifacts, these stories that are right in at the, at the lowest foundation layers of modern civilization, they're in Iraq. So Cyrus came into there from, from what we would know as Iran? Yes, yes. I mean, well, none of these places had those, none of these places have those names. Um, he's coming out, well, it's the kingdom of Elam. You know, he moves on his neighbours, the Lydians and the Medes, and he pulls them together into one. Then he moves on Mesopotamia and Babylon. So, so those cities, Nineveh, Nimrud, they're pulled into, into Cyrus's empire. So what he creates had not existed before. He creates something that's entirely new. And although that cylinder wasn't found until 1879, its message had already been reverberating around the world. You know, the, the artifact was found, but the story, the story that's that's on the cylinder uh, had already been described uh, by Xenophon. Xenophon was a Greek, he was a contemporary of Socrates, and he wrote about Cyrus in a book called the Cyropedia. And the Cyropedia described the benign, the benevolent rule of Cyrus the Great. And the book was read by, amongst others, Thomas Jefferson, who was the principal author of the American Declaration of Independence. He was also the third president of the United States. He had read the Cyropedia. And so notions of freedom of religion, tolerance of faith, that find their way into the American Declaration of Independence, to some extent, find their way into that document, courtesy of the thinking of Cyrus the Great, all of those centuries and millennia before. So the Hebrews are sent home to build their temple, but this is the final fall of Babylon. This is the moment. This is the end of an era that had lasted since the beginning of our story, since the time of Inhedioana and her hymns. Everything that's happened since up to and including this moment in the story of the world. Mesopotamia has endured all the while. It's always been there in one form or another, ruled by one king after another, but it has always been Mesopotamia. It's been that wellspring of civilization. Well, from this moment, no more. Babylonia is gone and gone forever. It becomes just a fossil of history. It no longer contributes to civilization in any active way. Interestingly, when Babylon falls, Egypt, Egypt, which has lasted so long, is also on the wane. So those two great civilizations are over or on the way out, one or the other. And something new, something 
new and something significant has appeared for the first time and will affect everything ever after. On the banks of the River Tiber, the First Republic was born. Blind faith and obedience to royalty and hereditary rulers were thrown out. The Roman population now decided for itself what must be done. Influenced and motivated by Greek thinking, the empire that emerged would last for five centuries and change the old world beyond recognition. Next time in my love letter to the world. To help support this podcast and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment vodcasts every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. It would be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter. My YouTube channel is simply called The Neil Oliver Channel. And to help build this podcast, tell your friends about it, get them listening, and write a review to convince the online crowd to join us. For further reading about these moments in time, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the World in 100 Moments, and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the World is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is composed by Milo McKinnon. Social media and YouTube producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucy and Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. Thanks for listening. This has been an FBF Podcasts production.